Okay, thank you all very much. Um, so this is some work done at uh, the University of Cambridge with Simon Moore, Alexander Junot, and um, especially Robert Kavacic. And um, we had done some experiments with a capability system that depended on tagged memory. So we had to tag um, pointers, essentially, in memory. And uh, we constructed a certain system, and we would expect a, a certain uh, level of memory overhead due to uh, tagging the way we did. It turned out to be much better than we expected. So we did a thorough investigation, and um, this is what we've ended up with. Okay, so I'm going to start with kind of a silly story that will set up, set up the problem. So this is sure to have happened a few times over the last 30 years. So a young engineer, we'll call him Johnny, he goes into his, his boss's office. And he says, hey, I've been reading around the literature, and it looks like if we could just have one extra bit of metadata for every word in memory, we could do some amazing stuff. We could get some really cool security guarantees or some uh, profiling of what's going on. For example, we could tag pointers. And then we would, never have, we would never have type confusion between pointers and data. That's amazing. Or we could even prevent pointers from being modified arbitrarily. And then pointers could be capabilities. Or we could, um, potentially, we could mark all of allocated memory with a tag so that if you try to access memory that's not allocated, then we could throw a fault. All we need is one bit of uh, metadata for every word in memory. OK, so then his boss says, Johnny, seriously, um, we, we could probably modify the registers inside the core to be one bit bigger. We could probably modify the caches to be one bit big, bigger. But there's no way we're going to convince management to use non-standard memory. We can't even afford ECC memory around here, let alone something that you just cooked up. So Johnny goes away a little bit sad, has some coffee, and has an, uh, another idea. He comes back pretty soon and says, look, we could put a tag table in standard DRAM. So let's stick with standard DRAM. And we'll, we'll just make a table. And for each word in DRAM, we'll have one bit in this table. And it's going to be a little table, maybe 1 64th the size of memory, right up at the top. We'll emulate a wider memory. And inside the chip, we'll think that we have a 65-bit word memory. But, but actually, out in DRAM, um, we'll just have a standard um, DRAM controller. And then, again, his boss is disappointed by uh, Johnny's lack of foresight. And he says, you know, Johnny, when we go out to DRAM, we're now going to have to access the data and the tag. That's twice the number of DRAM accesses. That's a non-starter. And you've got to remember, Johnny, security has got to be free. Nobody's willing to pay for security. OK. So then uh, one more time, Johnny uh, gives it a think and comes back and he says, hey, hey, boss, you know what? We can cache this tag table. So every time we go out to get a tag, we can pull in a whole line of tags. And then next time, uh, maybe it'll be in the cache. And this little cache is going to be really effective because with just one bit per word of memory, we can store tags for loads of memory in a really small cache. Once again, disappointed, his boss says, uh, Johnny, have you looked at the typical hit rate for last level cache? Because this is going to be just like a last level cache. The only memory accesses you're going to be seeing have missed in the L1 cache. They've missed in the L2 cache. They've missed in any last level cache. And what you see dribbling out the end has uh, very little locality. And you're, you're going to be lucky to get 50% uh, hit rate in these kind of caches, according to you know benchmarks on spec and that sort of thing. It says and adding 50% uh, memory accesses to DRAM is also unacceptable. So Johnny gives up, but being academic researchers, we didn't give up, and <clears throat> so we got a little further. Okay, so here's the challenge: we want to add one bit per word of memory, and we want it to be free. Um, let's review the system that uh, Johnny and his boss came up with. So this is the initial proposal here and pretty much what we've stuck with. So you've got the CPU, the, um, the on-chip cache hierarchy is extended with tags. So um, they're just a little, we're assuming they can be a little bit wider for each word. You've also got one bit tag to tell you to type. And then when you go out to DRAM, <clears throat> you send two accesses, one to DRAM for the data and another to a tag table manager that just does a table lookup for you. Now, that access is notionally going to DRAM, but it's backed by a cache that tries to cache those tags as, as best it can. Um, OK, so we did an experiment in GEM5 so we could get to the bottom of how, how things were behaving. 
So we traced all the DRAM accesses on a system with four cores and an eight megabyte uh, last level cache. Uh, we've run a number of um, applications at different times, but the two we're showing here is a JavaScript engine because this is an extreme example of having lots of pointers, which will be important later, and FFmpeg, which is a more typical data-heavy C application. Um, we've got prefetching on. Uh, this is, we were trying to emulate um, the biggest reasonable system that might be interesting. And so this is what we got, which was, uh, should be surprising. So we, remember, we have an 8 megabyte last level cache. So if we have a 64 kilobyte tag cache, which covers only 4 megabytes of data, our miss rate is already less than 40%. And then if we have 8 megabytes, which is actually the same size as the last level cache. So remember, this is a 128 kilobyte tag cache, but it's covering 8 megabytes of data. So we're holding the same capacity as the last level cache. And we're already just over 10%. And with, with only double the span of the last level cache for the 256 kilobyte tag cache, we're already less than 5%. So something very strange is going on here. Now, the, the only um, really... Um, different thing about this cache than a last level cache of six, 16 megabytes is that each line, which is a standard 64 byte line, is holding the tags for one page of memory. So we have really wide granularity in this cache. So then the question is, does this really uh, broad granularity, does it really explain um, this kind of hit rate, because this is quite quite a different hit rate than you would see with a last level cache of 16 megabytes. Is there really that much spatial locality? So we did an experiment um, with this uh, Gem 5 based simulation where we distinguished between misses, of course, and spatial hits and temporal hits. Now, a spatial hit is a hit that accesses a bit in the cache that has not yet been accessed. So Presumably, it was pulled in because of an access to a nearby bit. So that's a spatial hit. A temporal hit is a hit that was previously accessed in the cache, and it's accessed again, presumably because of a capacity problem in the, um, in the cache, the upper levels of cache. So we start with one byte, which is equivalent to a data cache line. And we do have a, a miss rate that's more typical of what we expect. But you can see, as the line size goes up, um, the spatial locality keeps paying off at higher to higher granularities all the way up to several pages worth, which is, um, which is not what you might expect if you're used to working with caches because most people don't go up to page granularities in caches because you'd be wasting a lot of data. Of course, it makes more sense here. Um, but it goes all the way up until we're only having about a 5% miss rate. So that is really impressive. It means even with the standard basic system that, that Johnny had thought up, you do much better than his boss was expecting. Um, so this, is, this has been just observed, well, not, not this underlying effect, but the fact that you get very high hit rates in these kind of tag caches has been observed by a number of different people who are doing similar work, because a lot of people have. But actually, this is the first time we saw where uh, we actually went in to find out what's the underlying purpose cause, because it's a little bit surprising, actually, if you understand last level caches. Um, OK, so this is pretty good. We got down to 5%. Um, but we've barely started to optimize. So we thought, what if we did a two-level um, table in order to optimize uh, the cache footprint? So what we can do is have a two-level table here. And in the top-level table, we have one bit to tell you whether there are any tags set in a line in the primary table, right? So that means. If we're sparse, which is, is a common case, with pointers you're often sparse, um, then you're able to amplify the capacity of your cache. So if only 10% of your, the lines in your application have tags set, then you can um, have the equivalent of 10 times larger cache, which should really help our hit rate in some cases. So uh, we looked at the pointer density so for various applications. And it turns out with some C, uh, as you get more object oriented, we get more pointers um, in our applications. So bzip2 is, is about 3% of the, of the lines have pointers. VLC has over 10%. There's C++. Chromium 
um, particularly because of the JavaScript has 30% of the lines have pointers. That still gives us uh, 3x amplification in our tag cache. And then we zeroed in on JavaScript where we have some very high uh, pointer densities. So then here's another use case. So we could compress pointers. That's, that's what we were particularly interested in, but this is kind of a, a fun toy example. Another use of tags, you could tag cache lines that are zero and thereby eliminate uh, writes to DRAM. So when you go out to DRAM, you could check the, the, this tag cache and say, is this line zero? If it is, um, when, on a read, don't read it from DRAM, just fabricate a zero and return it. On the other hand, if I'm about to write a zero out to DRAM, I could instead just write a one-bit tag. And in our little measurements, there was 1.5 to 2.5 percent of the DRAM um, lines were zero, not just the lines, the traffic going out were zero. So if we could manage to um, do the tag table with, maintain a tag table with less than 1 percent of DRAM traffic, then we would win. I don't know whether that would make sense to anybody, but um, this is kind of just fun. So with no compression, um, FFmpeg was already 0.5%, but when we turn on compression for FFmpeg, because remember it was C-based and has very few pointers, the overhead drops to nearly zero. Um, early Boyer only drops a little bit, because remember it had a very high density, but still we're at 3.5%. Now when we compress zeros, it drops down to about 0.1%. So this one would really play out. Now there's a lot of different applications for single bit tags. So for your application, you'd have to decide how sparse are you, um, whether it would make sense to compress like this. So we actually built an FPGA implementation of this. We have a parameterizable um, cache table lookup engine. In our implementation, this is a 64-bit um, MIPS with tag pointers. This is our capability machine. We have a 256 kilobyte level 2 cache. And so we were able to run real benchmarks and measure the actual DRAM bandwidth um, in this one. So these are some my bench benchmarks, which are um, some typical embedded C. And with, with all of those benchmarks, the, the DRAM overhead with compression completely collapses to zero, or so near zero you can't tell. Um, and with our JavaScript benchmarks, you can see um, the early Boyer and Splay, which are actually heat benchmarks trying to allocate as much as possible, we, d we still get a big benefit for compression, but e even more standard JavaScript benchmarks like a PDF renderer and Game Boy emulator uh, also have the overhead dropped to very near zero. So Johnny's boss would be um, happy here that w our overhead for tagging memory is, is actually approaching very near zero. And actually, this is only with two really simple optimizations. And I'm sure um, lots of us could think of more clever things we could, we could try. So what have we learned? Tag tables, tag, cache, tag tables cache extremely well because of spatial locality. And even simple compression pays off really well for storing things in the, in the cache. Um, such so much so that single bit tags can be cached with near, nearly zero overhead in the common case. Now there are, there are probably cases you could think of um, that, that are nasty, of course, for any particular um, different thing you're trying to store. Um, and particularly here, we're working on uh, capabilities which we hope will be practical for people to adopt in industry. And the point of this work was to show that um, tagged memory should not be a barrier to adoption in Cherry systems, so it shouldn't be um, something that causes alarm to designers because they're uh, just like Johnny's boss. Or they're worried about um, undue overheads. So that's that's um, all I've got. I'm ready for some questions, if that's okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Do we have any questions? We have actually quite a bit of time. Uh, I'm curious to know if, uh, my question is probably not relevant to your fl presentation flow, but uh, using tag memory, uh, how more secure is your code base? So were you able to, how, how many vulnerabilities were you able to eliminate using tag memory? So there, there are quite a few different schemes that rest on tag memory, and each has its own guarantees. 
we, we've worked a lot with capabilities. And the basis of capabilities is you're making a segment descriptor unforgeable so that the, the fact that you own a pointer to a region of memory gives you the ability to access it. And without that uh, pointer, you, you um, could never access the memory and you could never fabricate it. So um, that particular application has, um, in the architecture, has lots and lots of use cases, bounds checking and um, sandboxing and all, all sorts of things. Uh, and depending on how you use it in the software, you get different guarantees and different overheads. But all of that rests on um, the pointers in memory being unforgeable so that you can detect if somebody's modified illegally uh, some byte in memory. So there's not a direct answer to that. The question is, if you've got, um, if you've got some system that is just amazing, a lot of them seem to rest on tagged memory, a little bit of metadata on the side. So this is just to inform um, the community that this isn't as scary as it sounds, because it sounds pretty scary to a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah, William Wong from ARM Research. Um, so I would think in that so for the tag, I suppose the tags are mostly read and uh, very, I think a lot of written much, right? Say again, a lot so of what? The tags are mostly being read only. Read? Yeah, and very rarely the tags will be written. Is that correct? Um, so if you have a, s so you end up with more dirty lines in the tag cache than you would in a standard cache because the, loca the, um, the lines are so wide. So if you, in the simplest case, if you wrote any word in the entire page, you would end up with a dirty tag cache line because you would have changed, um, you would have written that line. Okay, but uh, that's not, doesn't mean you necessarily change the data, right? Because if you had data originally, so say we're talking about pointers, you had data and you wrote more data or different data, you didn't actually change the tag bit, right? So what we did is write elimination, which it has other use cases too. And when you get out, when you get out to the tag cache, if you're writing different, if your data that you're trying to write is exactly the same, which will be very common because what if you have a whole page full of data and you're just changing the data and you never write a pointer, it will be exactly the same as it was. So you don't end up with a dirty line. But say you are using the system, which hopefully you built it because people are going to use it, you will end up with pointers in different places than they were before. And those will all be dirty. And you'll end up with more dirty lines than you would otherwise because any, any change of the pointer pattern in a whole um, page is going to make, make you dirty. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually, I have a follow-up question. <laughs> Sorry. You can find Jonathan uh, offline. We have time for one more question. So, I was wondering if you have looked at uh, uh, exploiting kind of prefetching or proactively throwing out tags um, on its own or in conjunction and correlating with data prefetches and tag prefetches. So we certainly haven't looked at that. Um, so far also, I don't think we've looked at the tag cache being a barrier to performance, um, partly because you can always pipeline with the data access. So the data access goes out, and you always know you have the entire DRAM latency to come back. So if you have to issue a, a tag cache fill, it's only going to be marginally worse than the miss anyway. But I'm sure we could make things even better if we thought about it. I think we're out of time. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. We had a lot of questions. Please do find Jonathan after the talk. And let's thank Jonathan again. Okay.